President Roosevelt and his party arrive at Chestertown, Maryland, aboard the yacht Sequoia. Arriving at the dock, they are greeted by their host, Mr. Hiram Brown. Going to the campus of historic Washington College, President Roosevelt and other distinguished guests attend the inauguration of Gilbert Wilcox Meade as president of the college with the formal notification made by the Chairman of the Board of Visitors and Governors, Hiram S. Brown. On behalf of the Board of Visitors and Governors of Washington College, I extend a hearty welcome to our distinguished guests who have honored us today by their presence at this ceremony, including particularly the President of the United States and Mrs. Roosevelt, and the Governor of the State of Maryland, Board of Visitors and Governors of Washington College, faced the task of selecting a new president who, by birth, education, and experience, was qualified to lead this institution along the path blazed by its founders over a century and a half ago. After investigating the records of over 30 different prospects in the educational field, and after having interviewed a large number of them, we have found a man who we believe possesses the necessary qualifications. Gilbert Wilcox Meade. I now, as chairman of the Board of Visitors and Governors of Washington College, declare in this public and formal way that by the action of that board, you have become the 19th president of Washington College with all the powers and duties pertaining to that office. And in that capacity, I present you to the faculty and students of Washington College and to our honored guests. Mr. President of the board, honored guests, friends, in assuming the duties of leadership in this venerable institution, it is fitting that I recall certain words spoken of this college by our first great patron. In a letter written shortly after he had received from this college the degree of Doctor of Laws, President George Washington wrote, among the numerous blessings which are attendant upon peace, and as one whose consequences are of the most important and extensive kind, may be reckoned the prosperity of our colleges and seminaries of learning. As in civilized societies, the welfare of the state and the happiness of the people are advanced or retarded in proportion as the morals and education of the youth are attended to, I cannot forbear on this occasion to express the satisfaction which I feel on seeing the increase of our seminaries of learning throughout this extensive country and the general wish which seems to prevail for establishing and maintaining these valuable institutions. As most of you already know, Washington College and this community have been honored only once before in the history of the United States by a visit from the President of the Republic. On the first occasion, the honor was bestowed upon us by the first President of the United States. Today, we are similarly honored by a visit of his illustrious successor, 
the 32nd President of the United States, who occupies on this platform a chair which belonged to George Washington and stood in Mount Vernon. Now, therefore, by virtue of the authority vested by the state of Maryland, in the Board of Visitors and Governors of Washington College, and by them delegated to me, I hereby confer upon you, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the degree of Doctor of Laws, honoris causa, with all the rights and privileges thereto appertaining. Chairman Brown, President Meade, Governor Ritchie, friends of Washington College. I do not think either that it would be appropriate or that I could say anything that would be adequate after the very splendid words which you have heard from the new president of Washington College. He has spoken as the new head of a living college to living men and women. He has spoken of today and he has spoken of tomorrow. And yet, in coming here, I cannot help but feel the past. I cannot help a very close relationship with the early days of the Republic as I stand here the second president of the United States to come to Washington College. After a period, after an elapse of a century and a half, that both in wealth and education, there is representation only of a minority of the people. And therefore, as he went on to say, the wider that we can have a distribution of wealth in the proper sense of that term, the more we can make it possible for every man, woman, and child, every family throughout the land to have the necessities for themselves in such shape that they do not have to lie awake nights wondering where the food for the morrow will come from, then we will have the kind of security that means so much to the progress and the safety of a country. And in the same way, if we could provide in this nation for an adequate education for everybody, then again, the security of the country would be vastly safeguarded. It is in this spirit that we encourage and foster the institutions of education throughout the land. It is in this spirit that we are seeking today in times of depression to prevent further attacks on our educational system. It is in this spirit that we believe in building up the possibilities for education for every boy and every girl. Because in the last analysis, people who have had a chance to look not just at the history of things in the past, but to look also to the application of that history, 
to the problems of the moment and of the future. It is that thought, that objective that leads us to encourage the ideal of education in the broader sense. There is a tendency, of course, to lose sight of the forest for the trees. There is, of course, a tendency to magnify today as always the machinery, the little changes which are stressed unduly and to forget the principles. Every man and woman with education has a twofold duty the first is to apply that education intelligently to the problems of the moment and the problems of the future. And the second is to obtain and maintain contact with and understanding of the views of the average citizen of their own country. We have accomplished much, my friends. I think a great deal in the last few months, but at the same time, we cannot attain the goal within the few months. Some countries which have what I believe are known as dictatorships have laid down five-year programs and four-year programs, and ten-year programs. I believe that in this country, which has not got a dictatorship, we can move further towards our goal in a shorter space of time without giving it a definite number of years. So in the years to come, not just during the life of an immediate program, but all my life, I shall continue to watch Washington College, its president, its faculty, and its students, and its graduates, with the feeling that I am one of them, that I have been very greatly honored that I have been greatly honored in being made an alumnus of the college. And I breathe to you the same prayer that George Washington gave to the college nearly a century and a half ago, that the creator of the universe will look down on this college, give it his benediction, and help it to prosper. And so let me tell you very simply and from the bottom of my heart that I am very proud to have come here today, very proud of the honor that has been conferred upon me, and that I wish you all Godspeed in the years to come. After the ceremonies, Mr. Brown entertained the president and his party at luncheon.